We Have Issues is a weekly podcast full of reviews of comics and oversharing. We use grown-up language to make very childish jokes. You can find the show at wehaveissues.net, as well as anywhere else where average to not too bad podcasts can be found. This is the latest episode of We Have Issues, uh, the comic book podcast that you're listening to right now. can't really think of much else to say about it. It's probably not the best comic book podcast, almost definitely the most uh, neurotic and twitchy and self-reflective. Unscripted, the most unscripted. Did I, did I mention that? I think actually most podcasts are probably unscripted. It's just, uh, it's just that people as a natural rule, get better at doing stuff when they've been doing it for a really long time. And uh, we've been podcasting for about five years, but apparently haven't got any better at it. So uh, it's very twitchy and awkward all the time. It's also very difficult to start a podcast when there's just you. Uh, I, Mark Maron's very good at it on his uh, WTF podcast. Um, lots of the people who contribute to our show are very good at doing solo podcasting. But uh, I've never really got the knack for it. I don't know about James or Jane or Jesse or John. I'm sure they'd all be excellent at it. But none of them are here. It's it's just me right now. It's it's just me on my own. Um, unfortunately, none of the others could be here. I don't know if you've heard about the Ebola epidemic that is uh, sweeping the Western world. Uh, none of them have Ebola because... It isn't really sweeping the Western world. That's just a whole pile of bullshit. But they are not here for other reasons. Uh, mostly medicine related, one way or another. Some of them hygiene related. Oh, that actually works. In all cases, medical or hygiene related. So for now, it's just me. Uh, ho- hopefully, John will be turning up later on. So it's probably going to be quite a short episode this week. Sorry about that. Or, congratulations, it's probably going to be a short episode this week. As long as I don't get John onto the subject of Transformers or anything else he really cares about. I'm going to have to try and avoid getting John onto the subject of anything he cares about, okay? Um, and the only things he really talks about are things he cares about, so this could be quite difficult. So, uh, so what's been going on with me? Well, oh, thanks for asking. Not a lot, really bit podcasting lots of uh getting bent out of shape about gamergate well not really about gamergate about the discussion around gamergate um everybody's very annoying about gamergate both pro and anti people they're all very annoying luckily this isn't a video game podcast so you don't need to worry about that we won't be touching on it this week and james isn't here anyway so there won't be any long uh un- uncomfortable uh, uh, uncomfortable discussion where I try and make a point and then, uh, he, he decides I'm, I'm being a misogynist and, and starts, uh, starts shouting at me and we end up, uh, wrestling in a, in a heap on the floor. Maybe his shirt's like slightly, the, he wears a button down shirt. So maybe, maybe the top of it's a little bit ripped and you can see a little bit of his chest and, and, and he keeps rubbing my face in it. And, uh, and I'm, I'm trying to squirm away, but really I'm just kind of rubbing, rubbing up against him and maybe my trousers have accidentally come open. And, uh, everyone else in the room is just looking on in horror that two such close friends can, uh, can feel so much animosity at the slightest thing. Uh, but a- a- actually, uh, there's a, there's a subtext going on there that involves frottaging, heavy, heavy frottaging. So yeah, so that won't be happening this week. Uh, although we are going to be recording, obviously, uh, James and I do record another podcast together. Hopefully we'll be doing that in the next couple of days. So maybe there'll be some wrestling then. I don't know. Uh, so aside from that, we've, uh, uh, we, we may have sold a house, my wife and I, not James and I, uh, my actual wife and I. Uh, we may have sold a house, but it's, it's still early days. I'm trying not to get too excited about that. I'm heavily caffeinated. I'm having a bit of trouble sleeping and that's making me quite tired. Which, uh, which means that 
I'm having to drink a lot of coffee, but I don't think the coffee's really working and might actually be the reason why I'm having trouble sleeping. And so I'm drinking these really cheap energy drinks that have come up elsewhere before. They're called Boost. I don't think they're anything to do with the chocolate boosts. And I don't think they're really doing me any good. Uh, so um, un unrelated to that, I'm pretty certain uh, I'm having terrible, terrible trouble with my bowels. And uh, my confidence is all cock leaky It's all over the place. So, yeah, so it's just as well I'm, I'm having to do some solo podcasting because that always does my confidence loads of good. I said that this is We Have Issues. It is. It's still We Have Issues. You can contact us at issuespod on Twitter, issuespod at gmail.com via email. We're on Facebook and, uh, and we're also on SoundCloud. And uh, you can subscribe to us on iTunes or any of your podcasts of choice. You can also listen to all of the episodes at wehaveissues.net. There are normally full show notes on, on every episode. So if you want to skip to a review of something you like and want to avoid all the talk of, of dodgy bowels and, and, um, and, and aggressive wrestling, you can do that. I don't know why you'd want to skip past that stuff, though. I think that's the stuff that people really tune in for, to be honest. Yeah, so we do talk about comics, and, and I'll talk about comics now. Just because this popped up in my Twitter feed today, and I didn't, I didn't know that uh, it even existed quite yet. There's a podcast I listen to called Thrilling Adventure Hour, which is a, a sort of a live show done in the style of old-time radio. Wow. I thought I was describing it completely off the cuff, but that's basically just what they say at the beginning of the show. Lots of great actors go through it. It's All of the shows are written by Ben Acker and Ben Blacker, and uh, there are a few recurring serials that go through it. And I, I know that they've been working on doing comics for a, a little while now, and I've been hearing stuff peripherally about it, but apparently the, there are actually books are, are going to start coming out soon. So the thing I picked up today was a preview that has two stories in it. There's Beyond Belief, the adventures of, I think, the 1920s socialites, Frank and Sadie Doyle, who uh, see ghosts and have adventures and are alcoholics. Um, they they only really enjoyed it doing one of those things, that's uh, being alcoholics. And uh, Sparks Nevada, Marshall on Mars, which is a, a kind of a Western about a sarcastic human marshal having to deal with robots and native uh, Martians and stuff like that. The actual podcast is brilliant. All of the characters... Uh, all of the main characters are played by the same actors every uh, every show, so they've they've very definitely uh, over time made these characters their own. And it's interesting seeing this in comic form. Uh, ben Acker and Ben Blacker have written comics before. I know they've written a Wolverine series, uh, but it's a slightly odd fit, especially on Sparks Nevada. It's a slightly odd fit them translating voices that uh, that. I'm assuming it's not just me, it'll be them as well, are so used to hearing in a, in the voices of their actors and trying to translate that into a narrative that's there on the page. The Sparks Nevada story is written by them with illustrations by, uh, I think it's Jason Bone, and a colour art by Geordie Belair. And it looks lovely, it's very cartoony, um, very clean lines, lovely colour palette, but it's quite riotous and chaotic and it's not really how I feel... It's not really what I picture when I hear the um, when I hear the show, and there are certain things about the way that uh, Sparks Nevada and his supporting cast of characters engage with each other and talk to each other and, and their their uh, their vocal mannerisms that sometimes makes it a little bit difficult to parse exactly what's going on on the page. But it's it's fun. Both of these are origin stories. So we get to see how Sparks first meets one of his most loyal and recurring companions in the show, which is a lot of fun. And as I said, the art the art and colour is lovely. And, uh, and these are characters I really like anyway. Beyond Belief, though, Frank and Sadie Doyle. Again, this is written by Ben Acker and Ben Blacker. It's got art uh, by Phil Hester with colour art by John Rauch. Uh, the ongoing series is going to be inked by Eric Gapster. I'm not entirely sure if this uh, short was. I could check, 
but it's uh, it's on my uh, tablet. I bought it earlier on today, and uh, and I find it really difficult to navigate backwards and forwards on digital comics, which is another reason why I'm not that sure about them a lot of the time. Um, it looks gorgeous. Phil Hester's work is always amazing. Very thick lines, very uh, uh, blocky, but uh, very clear. Um, kind of a gothic look to it. As I said, this is a period piece, and it's... It feels very authentic to the era that it's set in, for all I know. Don't really know history, me. That's really James's bag. Apparently I say things like, that's his bag. That's weird. The uh, the Frank and Sadie Doyle stories, the Beyond Belief stories, they're kind of, uh, although they're very quirky and they talk in a very 1920s sort of snappy style with each other, it's very witty and very quick and sassy when they perform it live and and that carries through with this it's it's very arch but it's uh it's got a supernatural side to it they as i mentioned they see ghosts and monsters and all sorts of other things this is the but this is the story of how the two of them met how frank and sadie met and it's also about the first time sadie has a, a genuine honest goodness supernatural experience and it's handled really nicely. Uh, the thing about Beyond Belief is, despite it clearly being about two characters who are alcoholics, and despite it having this uh, th- this whole story generator of them being supernatural investigators, even though they don't want to be, they just kind of want to be left alone. Beyond Belief is really a love story. I didn't tune into it straight away while listening to the podcast, but really the thing that is most interesting about these characters uh, when they're together is that the way they're written and the chemistry between Paget Brewster, who plays Sadie, and uh, I think it's Paul F. Tompkins, who plays uh, Frank Doyle, is just incredible. And they're so warm towards each other and they're so romantic, uh, even even while they're just... Uh, their main way of communicating is by refilling, asking for and refilling each other's glasses and then drinking. Um, it's just, it's just quite lovely and, and it warms this cynical old bastard's heart that two ghost seeing alcoholics can form such a connection with each other. If, if, if they can do it, then so can anyone basically. And they really do adore each other. This is when they first meet and we really do learn that that attraction was instant and and quite lovely to watch so i'm quite looking forward to the sparks nevada comic when it comes out it's got a date of february 2015 coming from image comics i don't know if that's february 2015 in american comics styly i'm not sure if image have adopted the dc marvel method of uh dating stuff a couple of months forward um, so I'll, I'll probably look into that. But this is very cheap for two uh, short but complete uh, done-in-one stories. Some absolutely lovely art, some really nice characterization, And the Beyond Belief story on its own is worth the price of entry, and which I think only cost me about £1.50. Um, I will put a link to it in the show notes and you can go read it yourselves, listener. And if you're not already listening to the Thrilling Adventure Hour, it really is worth your time. But obviously don't listen to all of them because then you won't have time to listen to any of us and and that'd be lame. Well, it wouldn't be lame. I mean, it'd be good. You'd be getting a decent podcast out of it, but we'd it'd be sucky for us. Um, actually, while we're on the subject of uh, digital comics, <clears throat> the other thing I want to mention is I've got a, a lot of... I've got a lot of guilt around comic reading at the moment. I never used to have this. I always hear about people uh, complaining about how bad they feel, about all the money they've spent on comics that they then haven't read, and they've got these giant to-read piles, and I have never had that problem at all uh, in the past, even though I used to buy an awful lot of comics when I worked at Food and Planet. But Humble Bundles, which I've always enjoyed when it comes to video games, and I know I've mentioned them on the show before, uh, just one humble bundle can completely fill up your tablet with stuff that you need to read. And at the moment, I've got all of the stuff from the Image Humble Bundle from a few months back. That's uh, the first trade paperback of Revival, the first trade paperback of Morning Glories, 
Um, I think Lazarus is in there, even though I'm up to date with that. East of West, Fatal, they're all in there. And then like an idiot, I recently bought the the Valiant uh, Humble Bundle because they look nice and they were really, really cheap. I haven't even opened them yet. Uh, so if you want uh, guilt-free comic reading, keep doing what you're doing, but try to feel less guilty about it. But if you want to fill your comic reading with guilt, uh, start buying stuff really cheap in bulk online. I've also got a Marvel Unlimited account that costs £5 a month, and uh, and I haven't had a chance to look at that at all. So, um, yeah, lots of guilt all came in through my front door uh, when I started buying comics online. Uh, buying digital comics, I should say. Which is just great, because what I really need is is uh, is guilt in my life, or more guilt in my life. As if I didn't feel guilty about plenty of other stuff already <sighs> that's made me feel pretty glum actually um we need to boost things up with a tiny little bit of optimism well quite a lot of optimism actually we get contributions quite regularly from our friend peter hammerson uh i say our friend and that makes it sound like nepotism we met him through the podcast and he's great um he's doing a series called event management uh, which he, in which he covers major comic events, uh, like crossovers and, and stuff like that. But I, he's taking quite a methodical look at them. But, uh, I, I think maybe Peter has noticed that on this show and on the previous one, the Momcast, I at least have been pretty down on DC since the whole DC 52 thing we try to be positive so what that's meant is that we try to be positive about comics what that's meant is I just haven't really been reading any of them or covering any of them because I've had a bit of trouble with the the uh, aesthetic they've chosen to go with and the fact that they devolved pretty quickly into crossovers again I know that Jane and James have both read a, a little bit they certainly enjoyed Wonder Woman for quite a while and and uh, and, and the Batman books and stuff like that but I certainly am quite negative about them. And I think Peter was as well, but he's recently decided to give them another try. And uh, and he's quite liked what he's seen. So, uh, God, that was lame. I sounded like Alan Partridge. So uh, I'll pass you over to Peter. And then when we're back, I think John will be here. And you won't have to listen to me rambling anymore. Greetings. It's Peter Hammerson here again. How are you all? I'm taking a break from reading event comics this week because today I wanted to talk about DC Comics in general. I wanted to tell you that I'm seeing a bit of a change coming, which is making me feel more DC positive than I have in ages. Ever since the new 52 launched, I've been hearing the same complaints. It's too grim, it's too dark, it's too violent. These were soon joined by It's Too Complicated insofar as the inordinate number of crossovers and events quickly turned into a continuity quagmire rendered inaccessible by the sheer number of books needed to keep up. Now, I'm not here to repeat or refute these arguments, but what I do want to say is, if you've been automatically avoiding comics with that new 52 logo on them, now's the time to think again. And I will give you five reasons why. Reason number one, multiversity. Grant Morrison has been threatening us with this book for years, and as such, it's a sequel of sorts to the original 52 weekly series and Final Crisis. There's nary a whiff of the new 52 about it, and it is magnificent. Dimension hopping over the top superhero insanity of the highest order. Multiversity is basically the sort of project I read comics for. Reason 2. Gotham Academy. A brand new title, Gotham Academy is a fun adventure comic. It's a modern, teen-focused drama crossed with the sort of hijinks and danger you find in more classic children's literature. It's fresh, on the surface it's light, but there is some darkness lurking within. This is a new 52 title, without the 90s image overlay. Reason number three, Batgirl issue 35. The new direction for Barbara Gordon is fantastic. This is virtually a Bat book in name only now, and, and that's a good thing. Gone is the new 52 house-style battle armour. Gone is the overpowered Bat cycle. Gone are the high-tech gadgets and armoury. 
most interestingly, also gone, is the captioned inner monologue that I think has been mandatory in Bat Books since year one was published 30-odd years ago. I highly recommend it. Reason 4. Justice League 3000. Wait. Justice League 3000? A weird spin-off book from the fringes of the New 52? Why is that worthy of notice? Well, this is because Justice League 3000 will soon see the return of one of DC's most beloved double acts. Not Punch and Julie. I am referring to Blue Beetle and Booster Gold. And not some New 52 iteration of the characters either. This, apparently, will be the original post-crisis Blue and Gold. For we are not in the future of the New 52 here. We are in another place. A better place. A place where Max Lord perhaps didn't turn into a raving villain, and the legacy of the 1980s Justice League series lives on. If you have any love for the Giffen de Mateus Justice League, you won't be able to resist this. I know I won't. Reason 5. Secret 6. Now, Secret 6 was one of the best series to be cancelled just prior to the New 52 relaunch. It will soon be returning, Although this incarnation doesn't have any story links to the last volume, it will be written by the same author, Gail Simone, and will have a few familiar characters. I had to catch up on The Secret Six after the fact the first time, but now I intend to be in at the ground floor. So, five reasons there to pay attention to DC Comics' superhero line. Multiversity, Gotham Academy, Batgirl, Justice League 3000, Secret Six. If you lament the loss of the old DCU, or you're wary of the new 52's continuity heavy reputation, look for these books, ask for them by name, read them, enjoy them, keep reading them, because DC might just be ready to start giving us what we want. P.S. Also please read Ms. Marvel, because that's ace too. So that's a, a dose of positivity about something that I'm I'm personally not normally very positive about from Peter. If you're feeling a bit uplifted from that, don't worry. John and I will ruin that <laughs> for you really, really quickly. We just had a bit of a discussion about Minecraft. Not Minecraft. 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 You're going to sort of like hit the mics till they all pop out of the air and then make the Simpsons credits or something. I saw something today that suggested that Minecraft is basically just a clone of, a, of another game that wasn't marketed quite as well or something. What was the other game? Um, well, that's the thing. I, I can't remember because it didn't have it as good a name as Minecraft. Well. Yeah, I, the, the this has become a thing because they're bringing out a new game which is very similar that has like a, 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 a sort of a factory-style physics to it. It's like okay. a bit of a development on... Um, on the initial theme but it's like really similar and apparently Minecraft was really heavily based on his earlier game I just can't remember what it was called Blockability Blockability yeah exactly no but ology not Bollology Blockability yeah Blockability yeah I'm not going to remember in five minutes what I just said no don't worry about it Um, if you want to write in and tell us listener then probably need to find something better to do yeah so uh speaking of doing things what have you been up to since you were last on because you were on a couple of weeks ago with yep. me and jesse you? um jesse I and I, sorry been i don't know not really been up to much i've been playing computer games and reading comics and what? all the things i usually do what i'm interested in this because you haven't brought any comics to talk about i got you at the very last minute what comics have you been reading? Because um, otherwise you're just not really going to have anything yeah. new to add about comics. Um, I've been and this con- is a comic, this is a podcast about yeah. comics. I've been continuing with the Marvel collection, which now it's finished its initial run of 60 books, has decided to release 30 on either side. So there's another 60 books now. That will be 120 in total. That's going to be a very, very expensive thing to have collected. I thought but- it was a whole new... Thing um, they were doing. Oh no, that's a completely separate one. There is a whole new thing. This one is a kind of continuation because the original sixty books only went from about nineteen eighty to about two thousand and 
11, I think. Mm -hmm. And now what they've basically done, which I think is basically the whole thing that's got me really tied into now, is that they're releasing a lot 30 of the much earlier classic Marvel things. So there's a lot of origin stories in there. Um, Recently I read The Coming of Galactus, and I also was reading uh, Iron Man, The Tragedy and the Triumph, and there's been a lot of other things like The Birth of Ultron and, like I say, a lot of origin stories, and it's some early Doctor Strange, but they're also doing 30 volumes that go from more recently up to now and that also involves a lot of stuff I've not read like Schism and Fear Itself and Mark Wade's Daredevil run so they've basically after I thought right that's it I'm going to save myself the money that I was spending now no they've just tied me into lots more money and Um, Actually, I'm quite glad because I'm quite enjoy. I'm enjoying these books way more than I did any of the the previous ones batch. I had previous. Some of the older stuff I've read has just been absolutely mind blowing. Um, it's kind of funny in a way. Reading something like uh, the coming of Galactus was good because you just see what an absolutely misogynistic and misanthropic prick Reed Richards is. It's wonderful. Is uh, that that storyline is famous for being the first time a comics code uh, covered book uh, dealt with uh, a cosmic level entity ejaculating? That's right, isn't it? But I don't. I've never read it because it seems like it'll be a bit too much for me. So I don't know how it ha- how it happens. Well, uh, it's it's not like. So sort of you think with something like the coming of Galactus, people think that's how Ebola gets spread, but mm. actually it's um, a bit more sort of cleaner than that. And it's like I joke about the whole fact of the way in which Reed Richards is a really misanthropic git in these books, and um, how in the birth of Ultron, Janet Van Dyne is possibly one of the most hideously mistreated characters in the Marvel Universe, even before her husband beat her up. The way that she's treated by every other male character in the Marvel Universe is just hideous. But it's but it's what it was like back then, and it's really interesting to read these books now and to see the sort of cultural shift. And I know we also had, oh, you know, sort of comics are still a bit sexist and whatever, but it does really show you how much of an effort the people that create comics are making to change these attitudes. Some of them. Yeah. Not all comic creators. No. Well, (laughs) Hashtag not all comic creators. But then also the one thing I have loved about those old books in particular is some of the artwork is just mind-blowing. And it kind of makes you realise just how, again, how much even the artwork has changed. But it's like there is a cover to one of the uh, the Twilight of the X-Men books, which is called The Devil's Daughter. And just the title page is incredible. And it's literally just a massive pile of letters spelling out the title with people walking in and out of it. But it just looks like Who's nothing you'd ever see nowadays. I want to say Neil Adams, but I don't think it was because the books sometimes have multiple creators involved and there's been... So it means I've got to see work by Neil Adams. Mm -hmm. Um, I've got to see some early Jim Steranko work, which was absolutely incredible. I mainly know them for by reputation, Mm. like because they are a little bit before my time as well and I've never been one of those people who goes back and goes back and reads classic books so I don't really know very much of their stuff but I mean that's the thing it's only because I've been getting them as part of this sort of collection that I've actually like I said I wouldn't normally go and seek them out but all of a sudden I'm seeing the artwork that these creators did and I'm just like oh wow like you genuinely start seeing how it's kind of it's really interesting to read how comics were written then and Mm. to understand how it's kind of shifted and evolved at the same time, I think there's also certain things that we've kind of lost in a way. There's certain sort of like some of the 
like craziness. Like at one point in the X Men, I think Magneto kidnaps somebody and he puts them through a mind melding machine, and just it's like these panels of just weird ass sixties sci fi, where like with bodies floating in mid air, going semi transparent. It's incredible stuff, <laughs> and you just don't see that in comics nowadays. Yeah, it, it, there, there's a weirdness. They touch yeah. on that quite a lot on Rachel and Miles Explain the X-Men. Uh, and I guess any... I know Stephen Lacey's doing a, a, a similar thing with Fantastic Four comics mm. as well. Uh, and yeah, some of that stuff out of context is pretty... Well, end in context is pretty crazy. G- g- uh, g- g- planet-sized ejaculation notwithstanding, even before you take that into account. Mm. I uh, The thing about gender is that I've a little while ago I looked back at some of the old Secret Wars comics yeah. a, about a couple of years ago I was um I was going through all my old copy my, all my old British copies of that because I was going to give them away and scanning bits that I liked and that was in the mid 80s and the t- period you're talking about is a little bit before then oh yeah no but it's the still it was still late really 60s early 70s it was still pretty bad by then well this is something one of my friends commented on when he said that he uh, he picked up a uh, essential Marvel collection of X Factor, which was from like the very early eighties. And he said that even in that, some of the sort of stereotyping and the way they were talking mm. was—he said it felt really kind of like what? This is really horribly sexist. You kind of expect it with things in a way like the early Fantastic Four and that because they obviously that was like I said that was part of the culture then, mm. and it's just. Sort of like, I find things like that interesting to look back at and go, wow, this is really how people thought. What? Like I said, the treatment of Janet Van Dyne throughout all the books I've read has just been absolutely dreadful. The way in which um, Hank Pym basically just turns around and goes, oh, you're a woman, go and get me something. Mm. And it's like, that's what Reed Richards is like with Sue Storm. The amount of times he turns around to her and says, I don't need you to be my wife, I need you to be a woman. Jean Grey doesn't have any real characterization no. for um, um, ages either. The, it's... The, the early issues of the X-Men is basically a bunch of guys perving on this girl in really quite unsettling ways. And it's quite sort of strange. You're just like, why... Are they? Why are they behaving like this? Oh, I don't know. It, but, so, yeah. well, because that's what it. She was yeah. the token girl, definitely. It's probably quite unusual that she was a redhead. Yeah. Really, because um, Professor X. There are a few creepy panels that aren't. You could say they're taken out of context, but they're not really. Yeah. Where he's it's, in love with her in a few of the issues, yeah, early it's issues. Really odd. Um and. The reason we look at the 80s comics and still see, even though that seems quite recent to us because they're the ones yeah. we grew up with, we grew up relatively open-minded and, and uh, uh, liberal, I think. Mm. James more than more than me. But I, I think we kind of grew up in the same time reading the same comics and we don't remember those comics being that bad. We remember no. reading them and that was... You know, we grew up to be the way we are and we read those comics and we don't think of women as... Like yeah. that. Well, we don't call them dull every no. other page. But if you... um, And there's lots of stuff going on about gender at the moment, but the uh, it, it can be quite weird sometimes because we spend a lot of time... Um, we spend a lot of time on social media. Mm-hmm. We spend a lot of time surrounded by people who are younger, even if they don't always feel younger. Because you're how old? You're I'm 74. Uh, no, I'm 35. So mid-30s. Yeah. So we spend time with people who are even five years younger than us or ten years younger than us who seem who, who seem like they're the same age. Yeah. And so uh, – and things are bad and things do need to improve. We can take that as red. Let's yep. just – you know, we don't have to deal with that right now. But when you spend a lot of time around people, you just get this feeling like – Gender, gender in comics, gender representation in comics and stuff like that is the worst. It's just awful, constantly awful. So then when you look back, and for me, whenever I look back at that older stuff, I'm like, well, yeah, we could be better at this. 
but we, it, things have improved so much yeah. over the last 20 years. I mean, that's... Like, it's difficult to imagine how much they've improved, really. And it's quite interesting, because, again, Secret Wars was part of the Marvel collection as well. And one of the things I remember, I wrote a piece for Monkey on My Back when the collection first started, and I didn't know what books were going to be included. And I took a punt and made a load of guesses and was pretty much universally wrong on about 90% of it. But one of the things I actually wanted to see in it, because it's a story that I've always wanted to read, is um, Chris Claremont's Rape of Miss Marvel. Mm. And the reason I've always wanted to read that is because it's the one occasion I know about where one of the writers actually took the heads of Marvel to task and basically stood up to them and said, look, what you've done with this character is completely wrong and you should answer for that. And that's one of the things because, all right, it's not perfect, but yeah, since then Marvel have at least made steps to improve. Mm. And sometimes it just feels like it's still, all right, there have been steps to improve, but it's still a long way to go. But at the same time, there has been improvement. Uh, what what I'll try and do for the listener is because uh, I didn't know anything about that I haven't read it and I didn't really know anything I didn't know uh, much about Captain Marvel Carol Danvers yeah beyond that Rogue had her powers and memory and mm. then um, and then the Kelly Sue DeConnick comic comics from recently it, I I've never been familiar with that character but I was there's an episode of uh, which I'll try and find a link to there's an episode we won't go into detail about it there's an episode of uh, Rachel Mars explain the X Men where they go into a lot of detail about yeah. about the thing you're talking about that that this it wasn't so much that it happened to her that it, this thing happened but it was this sustained storyline that wasn't that lasted, treated like a rape storyline at all it yeah was, and it was also I think the person that was responsible is also her son. It's confusing. It's a very, very confusing story. And it's... And twisted as well. I think it's, like I said, I've not looked into it in a very long time. So I do think it's probably better to post a link to people that are far more knowledgeable about it than us. But it's always fascinated me because it's always been one of the reasons I've liked Chris Claremont is because at the end of it, he stood up and basically just said... I'm not standing for this, mm-hmm. and the way in which he dealt with it was fantastic, and that's what I've always wanted to read because it's it feels like one of those moments where I think the culture really did shift, and or um, you know Chris Claremont, well he's been writing the X Men ever since, and probably will be for the rest of time. We don't have to get maudlin. The other thing, John Byrne, kind of attacked the way Sue Storm was treated a little bit around the same time, around the time of Secret Wars too. But the thing is, whenever John Byrne uh, um, does this, uh, the writing tends to be pretty good, but it's in the hate monger story, which was a pretty decent uh, uh, attempt at addressing racism as well. But whenever he deals with uh, gender imbalance and the way female characters get treated, there is also the side effect that they end up in bondage gear. It's it happened a bit in X Men, which might have been on Chris Claremont I, a little bit as well. But yeah, a Sue Storm in bondage gear during uh, as as New York Burns yeah. is imprinted on my memory, and it's a confusing. It's ideologically confusing for me. The um the one the other character speaking in bondage gear that just genuinely completely this was from reading the uh, Twilight of the X Men is when um Eric the Red turns up. He's a like, he's a confusing he, character. He is literally one ball gag away from being in a gimp suit. Like it's just a what? You don't you don't really listen to podcasts, do you, John? No. Uh, you, I mean, I'd I'd like it if you started listening to the ones you're on. Okay. First, but you should listen to Rachel and Mars explain the X Men. Um, I, I go we go on about it a lot on this show, but it's because they've uh, certainly for for James and I, and definitely for you as well. They're they're talking about comics that were quite formative. That yeah. they've just gotten onto the John. They're just edging, about to start on the John Romita Junior X Men at nineteen eighties X Men, and they've been talking about New Mutants, the first twenty issues of New Mutants, and it's just like that. Those are still my go to spandex comics. Yeah, I mean, I've got a friend recently who's been reading. I don't know why he decided to do this, but he went, "I'm going to read all of the X Men." Mm-hmm. And so he literally did start, and I think the last time I checked in with him, he'd gotten 
quite literally from the beginning in 1960 whatever and he made it all the way up to about 1995 i think and i was like it this this took him the best part of i think it was about seven or eight months and he was reading them pretty solidly and he was just saying like just trying to keep track of all of it well because it's nonsense no one does that with soap operas but anyway we're not gonna we're not gonna we've digressed already yeah we've started Uh, talking about comics of yesteryear and not comics of yesterday which is obviously when all the comics came out is it is it in the the galactus story is that when when do the when do reed and sue get married uh that is at the very beginning of the coming of galactus collection they released it's got the coming of galactus and then it goes into their little sort of thing with the inhumans and then right at the end is the silver surfer and galactus and i'm not generally a fan of stanley's writing but this, it, it's impossible not to like this book, I think, in terms of you literally just see the amount of ideas that are constantly flying off the page, constantly, and it's so interesting seeing how much this kind of built into a universe. And it doesn't, you kind of actually understand, really, that they weren't trying to build a universe. It just so happened that, the blocks landed in such a way that they had they made for a good foundation yes everything you said was right you just murder any segue that 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 i try and go into though at least you're not being nasty at least you're doing it out of enthusiasm james just does it because he hates me Um, (laughs) no it's okay uh but uh we talked about this a little bit before and you said that that you really want to um listen to the uh one of the first things that Peter covered, mm. Peter Amson covered in his event management uh, contributions, yeah. was was the wedding of uh, Reed Richards and Susan Storm. Mm. Uh, so yes, you should listen to that. We've already heard from Peter, but I figure now's as good a time as any to he's alongside his event management stuff where he talks mm-hmm. about events uh, like big comic events in the past. Obviously, there are events coming out now that he's reading and he wants to uh, talk about. I just want to mention that I don't the thing you, I don't think you know about actually uh, historically because it's one of the books you mentioned along with the coming of Galactus. Uh, you know that uh, the whole Schism storyline originally that's a typo. It wasn't going to be called Schism. It went in a very different direction. It was very much <laughs> semen oriented before, but they. Uh, they swerved into the name because schism sounded much more appropriate to what was going on. Anyway, you've really got it on the brain this month, haven't yeah. you? Peter is uh, reading the current Marvel event, the current Avengers X Men uh, Marvel event, Sixis. Axis. A- Axis, sorry, Axis. It the took logo me. Is really it, difficult it, took, to read. it took me about three days to figure out what it was actually called. And then it was only because one of my friends went, have you heard about this new Marvel event called Axis? And I was like, oh, is that what it is? And I looked at it, oh, now I see. Mm-hmm. It's all very interesting, John. Right, Peter's about to talk about it. Okay. <laughs> he's calling this, uh, he's calling it an event management front line because he's only talking about the first two issues. I think this is his way of padding out how many of these he gets to do. So it's quite nice. So we'll okay. go to him and then we'll be back in a minute. Hello, it's Peter Hammerson here. Welcome to event management front line. I will be reporting from the very edges of the latest comic book events. Today I have in front of me Axis, issues one and two, the latest event comic from Marvel. And I am going to be reading them right now, and I will be giving you my first impressions. Now I'm coming to Axis fairly cold. I know the background, uh, I know roughly that... uh, The Red Skull has stolen Professor X's brain and has somehow gained control of his mental powers. Um, The Red Skull had taken control of what's left of the island of Genosha and has set up some sort of mutant concentration camp there. And most recently, Magneto attacked Genosha and the Red Skull and apparently killed the Red Skull. Um, No spoilers, because that's all in the solicitations. But um, I will do my best to avoid spoiling anything from here on in. So, let's see what I can make of Axis Issue 1. Okay, well I finished reading Issue 1 of Axis. 
Uh, I'll just start by going through the credits. Uh, it is written by Rick Remender, with art by Adam Kubert. The colours are by Laura Martin and Matt Miller, with lettering by Chris Eliopoulos. So, Axis looks to be shaping up as a pretty competent superhero team-up story at the moment. We begin with the Avengers in Los Angeles. They're fighting a sideline threat, nothing particularly important. Become aware of the larger problem during the course of that battle. The larger problem being the psychic powers now wielded by Red Onslaught. We then switch scene to Genosha, where a number of X-Men and Mutant Avengers are trying to fight Red Onslaught. And gradually, over the course of the issue, they're joined by more and more members of the X-Men and the Avengers, until by the last few pages there is a great big team-up, which uh, is apparently stopped in their tracks by the cliffhanger ending. I think at the moment what Axis is reminding me of is the DC crossovers from the sort of mid to late 90s, where you'd have a weekly series during the course of the month, and then other books would tie in as and when they saw fit. Um, it doesn't look like every Marvel comic is going to be part of Axis, but uh, looking at the adverts on the back page, there are actually more there than I was expecting to be involved. At the moment, though, aside from the stuff that's covered in the lead-up to this story, I don't think that any of the tie-ins are particularly necessary. So I'm now going to move on to Avengers vs. X... Sorry, Avengers and X-Men Axis, issue 2. OK, so just finished Axis issue 2. Same creative team as before, and... Um, well, it, it, it's basically an issue-long fight... It was good, you know, competent, pretty much follows on the theme of issue one. And again, it really reminds me of those 1990s DC crossovers. Um, a lot of the characters get a little bit of screen time, but it's mostly about Iron Man in this issue. And at the end of it, just when you think it's all over, there's another cliffhanger. So we'll see what happens in issue three. Which I think, I well, I assume is published this Wednesday. So that is it from Event Management Frontline for this week. There'll be more the next time I read a couple of new event comics from Marvel and DC or whoever. If you'd like to contact me and talk about Axis or events or comics in general, you can find me on Twitter. I'm there as at Peter H, that's spelt P-Y-T-Y-R-H. So until next time, this is Peter Hammerson for Event Management Frontline, signing off. Cool, so that was, that was Peter Hammerson with uh, Event Management Frontline, the first of those little sub-event management episodes he's doing. I uh, don't know why I used the word sub. It's possibly because we were talking about uh, Susan Storm in bondage gear earlier on. <laughs> Uh, I, w I want very briefly to talk about a Kickstarter book I got because it's got lots of good in it, um, and I believe it's a, I believe it's a, available on the internet, uh, and I'll post links to that in the show notes. I'll mention now you can uh, get at the show notes at wehaveissues.net. Uh, there are full show notes for every episode. I've mentioned that uh, before John got here, but there are also links. Where it's something like this, where you can mainly find it on the internet, I've got links to it. It's called Torso Bear, uh, Yarns from Toyberg. Um, it's got a volume one on the side, which I guess means uh, that they're hoping to do more. Brett Brett Uren, who I haven't really heard about before, did this. Uh, and there was another comic in the bundle I got. There was another comic uh, by him as well, which was very folklorish and weird and odd and, and quite fun. Now, this book, I really like it. Uh, but the reason I'm not going to talk about it loads is because the liking it comes with caveats. Uh, the the uh, on overall, I found it quite an unusual read because okay. it's an anthology book. It's it's quite a chunky volume. There are lots of books in it, lots of books, lots of stories, lots of pages. It's set in a world um, in a town called Toyberg, which is in a world where it's all toys. There is a suggestion 
that there are humans, but they're like shadowy godlike figures who just come in and fuck with fuck with the uh, fuck with the animals. They come in. They come in and just like pick them up and go. Brr, brr, yeah, brr, stuff like brr. that. And it's uh, and and some of the story, some of the uh, toys have brutal stories about stuff that happens. There's one uh, one story that alludes really heavily to an event that happened. And and as you're reading it, and as you see the images on the page, um, you realise that he was clearly mauled by a dog or something his legs just a mess and it looks like he's been chewed on sort of thing so or a mm. child actually i suppose children do that um the the stories mainly center around a little teddy bear called ruxby bear who's pink and who has just become a policeman he's an expert in stitchology so he's just become a policeman but there's a he gets paired with this hard assed possibly racist towards soft toys wooden do- uh, wooden police doll called um Hasbro and the most of the police the sort of old school police are all like this wooden doll okay in that they're a bit racist towards soft toys but also in that they're these wooden these wooden police toys they kind of look like classic old bobbies yeah uh, bobby uh uh for our uh, listeners who aren't in uh aren't in britain or, or a really, really young Bobby is what we used to call police in this country before replacing it with police, and then the slightly less friendly pigs. I don't like that. What? I think uh, I, I think that uh, they've always been very nice to me. Oh, okay. I thought you were just being racist towards pigs. No, no, no. Um, the the way this book's structured is, as I said, it, it's kind of structured like an anthology book, and there are lots of different artists and writers. Uh, there are lots of different writers and artists working on it. The reason I even heard about this was because a writer I know called Cy Dethan, who who wrote the Cantstown books, and um, his partner Nick Wilkinson, who did the lettering, uh, who does the, who who is a letterer, did the lettering on on a story in this. They wrote and uh, wrote and lettered a story on this with, with art by Peter Mason. Um, and so she was promoting it quite a lot, and I follow her. So that's how I, I heard about this. And I'm quite glad that I supported this book on Kickstarter. But there are two things that don't quite work for me, and they're largely tonal, and they might work fine for other people. This is not This is a comic in that it's images and text and the storytelling's comic-y style, but there's this storybook... It, it it kind of uh, takes this approach where it it sort of merges uh, Chandler esque noir voiceovers like uh, cop voiceovers with um, children's book like so, captions. Okay. So there so. aren't speech bubbles. It's all voiceover. Okay. But it's so we're talking on. like hard boiled soft toy. Yeah, yeah, hard boiled soft toy. Um, and at the same time, although it presents itself like a series of shorts, mm. and some of them are very self contained, the uh, a thing that doesn't really work as well for me is that uh, uh, after a point, you realise that they're all they're all linked. It's actually telling one bigger story. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, and for me, and the the. The style in it and the colour and the production is is although not all of the styles resonate with me, the production is is pretty good throughout. It it's very nicely coloured, it's very consistently coloured, um, it's very pretty and very cute a lot of the time, and some of the horror moments are handled really well. But when it falls apart it tends to be where it tries to force this overarching narrative. There are times when this works perfectly and then there are times when it tries to pull it all together towards the end where I just don't know if it works quite as well. That said, you can read any one of these stories. There's a story uh, following a a knockoff toy that's basically like one of those um, uh, sort of normally Korean toys that looks like it was made from a Darth Vader mold but they're trying to do something different with it oh, because it's not licensed there's that sort of thing there's a Flex Armstrong story uh, that is really nicely drawn and written some of this book works so well but the overarching um, the overarching story doesn't quite gel for me and also after several pages the 
uh, I wanted a speech bubble, which is me being a traditionalist. There's just an awful lot of text, you know. And yeah. it's But I liked it, and I will post a link to it because I, a lot of you, um, a lot of you, you, the one listener, you, you know, a, a lot of people are going to really like this. It just wouldn't be fair if I if I didn't mention the couple of things I wasn't so sure about. No, that's fair enough. Um, shall we just listen to uh, another contributor? Yes, let's. Kihar has been sending in a few reviews. Uh, he has sent in one about Tarzan vs. Predator. We will listen to that now. I think he loved it. That's a bit of a spoiler. But he said in his email, loved it. So you'll hear about that now. Hello, it's Reese Kihar here from Dissecting Worlds. On this occasion, I'm discussing the trade paperback, Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan vs. Predator at the Earth's Core. Art by Lee Weeks and story by Walter Simonson. Uh, that is the same Walter Simonson of Thor fame in the 80s. Um, partly the ridiculousness of this title appealed to me. Partly it was the fact that I've really enjoyed the Edgar Rice Burroughs I've read and I've really enjoyed the span of his creation. For those not familiar, Edgar Rice Burroughs was basically the early, early 20th century pulp literature equivalent of Stanley. Um, not only did he create Tarzan, he created John Carter of Mars, look for a crappy movie over there, um, he created similar stories on Venus, the At the Earth's Core theory was, um, I want to say the land that time forgot, and hopefully I'm not confusing it with Anyone else? No, I think I'm right, The Land of Time Forgot. Um, pretty much, you know, anything Roy McClure was in, or was either Edgar Rice Burroughs or Edgar Rice Burroughs inspired. And, this is where he's like Stanley, he also did crossovers. So the fact that the Emperor of Pellucidar, the world that exists inside the Earth, at the Earth's core, a hollow Earth, if you like, um, is uh, spoilers um, de- deposed through various shenanigans and that his uh, realm becomes a plaything of a gang of predators hunting humans, beastmen and dinosaurs alike um, it's just natural to drop Tarzan in the mix with a combined US British military uh, expedition to see what's going on isn't it? Um, the art is suitably frantic, um, excellent, well coloured. It has a four colour theme, but everyone's recognisable, everything's well realised. Predators, being so iconic, are particularly well recognised. And so are dinosaurs. Did I mention dinosaurs? There's dinosaurs. Um, and Simonson delivers a similar sort of frantic, frantic, a gentleman charge ride as he did on his run of four. It probably doesn't bear too much examination for logic, but neither does Edgar Rice Burroughs' his stuff. So it's true to its source material, and it's true to Predator, isn't it? Predator's just a kind of a very pulpy concept and story, sort of B-movie story, elevated by uh, higher special effects and exploitation gore. So it works really, really well. Um, the plot twists are not going to set you alight with their originality, but it really doesn't matter because it's a radio M4. Um, so, an excellent uh, temporary acquisition from rural library services. Edgar Rice Burroughs' Tarzan vs. Predator at the Earth's core. Um, I dare say, because it's kind of so joyously formulaic, they can bottle lightning again, so I might look out if there's a there's another uh, trip to the well on this one. So that's Kiha from Dissecting Worlds signing off. Was that from the we can chuck anything in with Predator phase that they went through? In it was Dark Horse had the rights to both Tar- Tarzan and Predator, and they did a uh, a thing. But they also did like so it was Batman versus Predator. Then there was Batman versus Aliens versus Predator. Then oh yeah. Was, yeah. Batman versus Aliens versus You're doing Judge that thing again. John, you're doing Predator. that thing again. What? Stop. Stop.
collaborate <laughs> and listen. No, it's... It's it's fine, but I did get the feeling. You know, Dark Horse did an awful lot of crossovers, and I, I got a feeling for a second that you were going to do all of them. <laughs> Only the fine. ones I can remember. I I know you. That could have been a lot of them. Uh, so anyway, <laughs> thank, uh, thanks, Kiha. That's brilliant. <laughs> thank um, you, Kiha. And we'll hear from him again next week, I'm sure. Uh, right, this week's comics. We are gonna. <clears> this show is gonna. This show is gonna start shifting to a, a structure again at some point. Yeah. Um, the plan was to basically rip off the structure of the show we used to do, the Momcast. Not rip off. We came up with the structure. Well, so just reuse. Yeah. And I still favor that structure. It was a good but, structure. But uh, the uh, uh, circumstances have not allowed. We will get to that. I really miss Spotlight Books. We will be doing yeah. Spotlight Books again. Um, right, so. And this is going to be very weighted heavily towards me because John didn't actually pick up any comics this week no. because he didn't know about this until the last minute. Uh, Butterfly, number two. It's from Arkea. It's got a lovely Phil Noto cover. It's at number two of four, and it is written by Arash Amel and Marguerite Bennett with art by Antonio Fuso. Really nice, bold line art from Antonio Fuso. This is the second part of an espionage story about a girl who whose father dies under mysterious circumstances and then when she's in college she gets drafted into the CIA and then eventually becomes a secret agent. Reminds me a lot of Alias, the TV series. I was series. about to say that sounds very similar to Alias. Just um, yeah. Without a lot of the double crossy aspects of the plot. Um, and or, the fact that they have to have 70 twists every episode. Yeah, I only ever watched the first two series because once I got into the third series, it got a bit confusing. You get the gist, it's fine. Yeah, the you're, first doing two that, series you're doing that were thing great. we were just talking about, though, with, with the soap operas, with the, with the comic soap operas, where you were watching it trying to make sense of it. Yeah. Whereas I think they were making it so that you'd watch it every week. And like you were just supposed to, like a sitcom, you know, yeah. sitcoms, doesn't really matter what happens in every episode. But I was watching it on a box set, so yeah. that's oh, no, kind I mean, of what you do with box sets. Oh no, absolutely. You weren't doing anything wrong, John. It was their fault. But anyway, so uh, the first issue was about uh, her job going south. Uh, a, a particular mission she's on ends up with someone dead who isn't supposed to be dead. And it, it wasn't her who did it. But she realizes she needs to get extracted very quickly and she stops hearing from her employers. Um, so she has a last ditch contingency plan that she's heard about. There are myths within the agency that she's in. There's this one particular myth that she seeks out. And at the end of the previous issue, she finds this uh, hidden ex-agent and it's her father who she's thought has been dead for 20 years. This issue largely handles the immediate aftermath of that happening. The fact that she has uh, discovered that he isn't dead. He His first response is denial. Um, and then she dis- realizes that she has more, a bigger family than she thought she did. Because her father has not been resting on his laurels. Or, uh, or uh, resting on his cock, I guess. <laughs> He's, uh, he's, I knew he's you were going to come up with some sort busy. of resting on his knob joke. Um, but things things get out of control very, very quickly. Um, and she discovers her family. They have about an hour of getting to sit around dealing with that. And then they're on to the next thing very, very quickly. The slightly weird. I'm re- the art in this is gorgeous. It's written really nicely. The only thing that confuses me, and this happened with the first issue as well, is there's this uh, aesthetic decision made where the first half of the book is kind of a relatively down the line from her perspective story, and then the second, the second issue, there's just this abrupt shift in the second half of the first issue and in the second mm. half of this one, where suddenly you're dealing with his perspective, but it's told in a very different way. Um, it's really enjoyable in now that I'm used to it. It's really enjoyable in single issues. I don't know how it's going to read in a book yeah. when it's eventually collected, and obviously it's hard not to think about that. I just realised there's something major that happened that I did this week that I haven't mentioned, and it is comic related. If I get time, I'll talk about it later. Okay. 
Um, right, so Father's Day, uh, issue one of four. It's three dollars ninety nine from Dark Horse. It's written by Mike Richardson, who is publisher at Dark Horse, and is a. It sounds like damning with faint praise to say that he's a really super competent writer, but that's what I think of him as. He wrote, I think, a, the early Aliens comics and stuff like that. He's yeah, he's I mean, good. He's not someone you know as a writer, though. But he's think. he's one of those people that. He's enough. His name is enough to make you buy a comic. And the yeah. thing I know about you is that you rarely pay three dollar ninety nine for a comic. So the no. fact that you have done in this case means you must at least be slightly intrigued by yeah. the creative team behind it. Well, it's it, I flicked through it and it looked really nice. So um, it's it's uh, written by Mike Rich- Richardson with art by Gabriel Guzman, who I haven't heard of before. Really nice colours by I guess Java Java Tartaglia, um, and a, a cover by. Uh, Kieran Grant which doesn't look like the inside at all it's this really uh, fluffy don't really know how else to describe it really nice painterly cover um, I'll talk about this very very quickly because it's one of those ones that it, it plays out largely through not a lot happens in the first one It it's very uh, but at the same time loads does because it sets you up for the next three issues obviously for the story that's going to unfold really similar to Butterfly we are watching a guy uh who has a beach house that's really remote in the like in the middle of nowhere that's what remote means by the way just in case anyone wasn't sure and his there's a knock at his door he goes to answer it there's a young woman there and the first thing she does is uh she punches him in the stomach and then she just starts berating him and when you know, she hasn't really calmed down particularly to be honest. Uh, but when the dust settles a little bit, um, she tries to leave. She says, I've literally just come here to tell you this one thing. My mother, your wife, my mother died just now of like her mother died of natural causes. Uh, but she, it turns out she's his, uh, his daughter. He left, he ran out on them 20 years before. I think she thought that he died maybe. Okay. Um, and, she obviously discovered that her mother was keeping stuff from her. When her mother died, she comes after him and she's very angry. They have a situation, a quite a natural situation that means they have to stop and pause for a minute to discuss stuff. He is concerned as to how she found him. And when she tells him, well, I've just been like asking around trying to find you, he freaks out. In a way that's very similar to what happens in the the issue to a well, butterfly. I was going to say actually. it does sound very similar. Um, and and realizes that uh, men have come after him. They've used her coming to look for him to find him. Slightly different in that in butterfly they're spies. It's all about spies. In this, he's uh, apparently a hell of a criminal. Who, when his daughter was born, a lo- this is. This is told in the exposition of the first issue and then we're on to the main thing. But um, realised that when his daughter was born, he, by being the person he was, was putting them at risk and then disappeared. But you've got very similar dynamics. There's uh, a daughter finding a father and resentment. And it's, I don't know if it's a happy or an unhappy coincidence that I found both comics, that the, the both comics came out at the same time. Mm. But they're both completely different. The art in this is very crisp. It's very, it's very comic-y. The, there's uh, lots of very uh, detailed line work in it, whereas Butterfly was much more loose and, and uh, sort of expressionistic and stuff. So I'm really enjoying both of them. Uh, finally, and this is weird, and I know you thought this was weird, and this is another $3.99 book. It's uh, from IDW. It's written by Kate Leff, Um whose name I recognise as being connected to Good Things, which is part of the reason I bought this, with art by Drew Rausch, and it's Edward Scissorhands. Number one. The first issue of Edward Scissorhands. Uh, I don't know how long this series is going to run for. I know you had a chance to read this when I went to Lou. We should mention before anything else happens, uh, the, the back pages, the letters page, uh, they're, they're using it... Um, because Edward Scissorhands himself is a symbol of uh, longing and kind of adolescence and and being misunderstood and and having to hide away and loneliness and stuff like that uh, there and this seems either either like pandering or really cute 
or just a recipe for disaster. They're giving over their letters pages to people to talk about their, ad- adolescence. their adolescence and their angst. I hadn't had a chance to read this properly, uh, but but when I uh, when I uh, came back to uh, to find that John had read it, he found that there's actually a, a section uh, with a really nice photo actually of um, of Kieran Gillen, the comic writer Kieran Gillen who basically talks about his bass guitar. We won't go into too much detail because obviously people will want to read it and uh, there's no uh, um, there's no space to really tease here. Obviously everyone involved knew what they were doing and it's fine and we, we all were teenagers but it's quite cute and you can find out a little, there's a little uh, insight into, uh, into Kieran's early life there. Um, he was in a band, I didn't know that, called Fallacy. Spelt phallus. As in P-H-A-L-L-A-C-Y. Yeah. yeah, and if I was going to be in a punk band, I think that's probably what I'd call them. So I can't mock. Right, so the thing I want to say first, and I think you definitely felt this a little bit, John. I bought this, hmm. but the main reason I bought this was we we aren't a podcast that rips comics apart. I didn't buy it because I wanted to have a go at it. At the same time, I was kind of confused by it. There was an immediate moment there. And the reason I was confused by it is I love that period of Tim Burton's films. To be honest, I don't mind the current period of Tim Burton's films with one exception. So the I loved Edward Scissorhands. I saw it at the cinema quite a few times. There was a little cinema around the corner from my house. When I saw it quite a lot, I hated the town folk. It was a point at which I got very angry at characters in a film because I just hated them. I thought it was so unfair what happens to the main characters in it. Mm. But one thing about that particular Tim Burton film is it isn't a film about the plot. The whole point of it is it's a fable. These characters aren't designed to have a life outside of yeah. this story. It's a very self-contained story. And, and, and it's not designed to be... Yeah, it's not designed to be realistic. You're not supposed to... The characters, everything they do makes sense within the context of the film. But at the same time, they're all pretty much caricatures. None of them are... They all take their roles in what's essentially a modern fairy story, Mm. if you know what I mean. So you know that in a normal world, there's there's a death that happens towards the end of the film. And you know that in a normal world, that death would be investigated... And all sorts of other things would happen. You know that in a normal world, it's never really explained how Edward becomes a person at all, yeah. either really. And uh, and it doesn't make sense that when you do uh, when you do shavings of a um, like a, yeah. an ice sculpture that the whole town snows or any of these things. They're all designed to be allegorical and and beautiful. The town folk aren't real characters. They're all like stereotypes they're designed Mm. that way so for me the idea of following that with anything i'm not one of those people who normally says well it's just ridiculous why would you even do that why would you do a sequel to peter pan or so so long afterwards or why i'm fine with it normally but this didn't seem to be a world that was really rich with possibilities yeah um and the pitch for it if you had heard this pitched as a film it's one of those pitches that you would think, well, that's just a typical fucking ridiculous Hollywood pitch. Because it's it's one of those things where it, it takes place several years after the film. And uh, at the end of the film, um, at the end of the film, we see Winona Ryder's character as a very old lady talking to her granddaughter. And this comic picks up after a year or so after... Winona Ryder's character has died and the granddaughter has grown up and so it focuses on her as a teenager, as an Mm. awkward teenager and at the same time there's a story going on with Edward uh, up in the the house where he still lives and he's got his own little story as well. Um, If you 
that's one of those joke pitches that you hear at Hollywood. So the thing is, you'd think that there wasn't really anywhere to go. We know what happens to Winona's char- Winona Ryder's character when she gets older. We see that. It's all self-contained. We know he's up there. It's right to leave him up there. That's the emotional core of that story. That's the resolution. It's, uh, it, it's perfect. It's perfect. Where is there to go? But we see at the end of the film that Winona Ryder has a granddaughter. So... This is going to be the story about how Edward meets the granddaughter. It's one of those things that you you imagine execs pitching and pray to God we never get to see because it sounds awful, right? It sounds awful. You, you've thought about this way more than I have. I, I was in the toilet for a really long time earlier on. But the thing is, the I think the writer and artist... And the general story that they're telling, while not really feeling in keeping with the film at all, like the relationship with, between the girl and her mum is already better rounded out than any of the relationships in. Yeah. There's there's animosity there and there's a – the mum thinks Winona Ryder's character is crazy and obviously that's her mum so she's really upset. And there's all of this stuff going on and it's really rich and high school-y and teenager-y. Um, and it's handled really nicely. The thing I – I'm- found reading it earlier is that because my first thought on looking at it was why in the heck would anyone write an Edward Scissorhands comic was there really a demand for this and then I sat there and read it and if anything I was a little disappointed when I got to the last page because I wanted another 20 pages Mm. it somehow it's very different because whereas with the original film, you know you're watching a Tim Burton movie because all the houses are funny colours and they've all got weird wiggly roofs and stupid-ass things like that. Um, All of the stuff in the town and the high school elements are actually very realistic in Mm. this, whereas all of the parts with Edward are very fantastical. And it's a much greater divide than there was in the original film and I actually think that that makes it work a bit better as a story yeah I'm worried about when they when the two elements join up because I don't know how that'll work it's an interesting one because they've also got two very different art styles Mm. but the way that the story seems to hint that it's going and I don't want to say what Edward's side of the story is because I think that's actually very interesting and best served cold if you take my meaning but Edward's story has a very different art style to the granddaughter's story and I think that actually that helps make them work a lot better together but I am curious about what will happen when they go into the same, when they cross paths because they inevitably have to Yeah, I think think they will do I think it will be interesting because Edward's stuff looks far more fantasy related and hers is a lot more like slice of life yeah so i don't know it's really it's i have to admit the one thing is i really did enjoy it just reading it as a book i just picked up read it and was like oh that was actually a lot better than i thought it was going to be what what's distracting at first is that the art style is very uh very cartoony very stylized really uh sort of loose and sketchy and it Mm. doesn't it never really looks like anything tim Burton-esque until you see not Edward but uh, elements of Edward's story yeah. the, other, the other thing about it is that Edward's story looks like there's going to be an undercurrent of horror that just isn't yes. in the film really No, and a, it looks gothy but it's not really that's part of what really sold it to me mm. was that actually that's quite a freaky thing it's like okay so I'm kind of curious where they're going to go with that but I like the fact that they haven't just gone and drawn a Tim Burton style comic mm. they've actually kind of put their own mark on it and I think oh, it's also it's got a Gabriel Rodriguez cover you, I like Gabriel Rodriguez all the time so mm-hmm. he should do more stuff it's <laughs> it's way more interesting than I thought it was going to be yeah it's, it, it, it's, it's my genuine surprise of the day yeah I uh, that's all the comics we got to talk about this week though so in, uh, on the old show that uh, John and I were uh, oh, involved okay. with, the Momcast, one of our contributors, George Beedham, who is a, a drawfter from 
nebulously up north somewhere uh, who does the mighty jambo we, we live in southampton everywhere is north of here that's true uh, I'll I'll post links I'll post links to his comics uh, in the show notes uh, I, as I, I did last week. Just like to make the point, uh, the Mighty Jambo is mighty good. It's very very good. I had to interview George and I read a large chunk of Jambo and thoroughly enjoyed it. What you should be taking from that, George, if you're listening, is uh, is he said he had to interview you. So. <laughs> No, okay, that came out wrong. Sorry, no. George. Interviewing you was a pleasure. It's fine. You said what you said. It's fine. Uh, but uh, George did start a series. I famously do not like cosmic Marvel stories or just uh, cosmic comic stories that much anyway. And um, and George, this clearly stuck in his craw somewhat. So he started a series of contributions to try and address uh, the awesome cosmic comics in the Marvel Universe. I'm not Good. saying he's completely convinced me yet, but, you know, it's been fun listening to him. So uh, he's got uh, a contribution following on from that. If you want to hear, he did two before the Momcast finished. So if you want to go back and listen to those, I'll post uh, I'll post links to those in the show notes as well. But so here's George. Hello, I am of the North. Some refer to me as a Scouse author. Others know me as the creator of the mighty Jambo and notregret.com forward slash Jambo. In any case, my name is George Beadham, and I'm here to talk about comics. Specifically, to continue a series of contributions I began on the Momcast about how great Cosmic Marvel is. With that in mind, and to prove Nick wrong, I ploughed into 2006's Annihilation, so here's a quick recap. In Drax the Destroyer by Keith Giffen, Mitch Brightvisor, I still can't say that even after reviewing it once, and Brian Reber, protagonist, crashed to Earth with some fellow alien convicts, Regenerate a bit like Doctor Who, befriend a young girl called Cammy, who you may know from Avengers Arena, kill all the other aliens he crashed with, and then get arrested by the Nova Corps. In part two, I looked at Annihilation Prologue by Mr. Giffen again, Scott Collins, Ariel Olivetti, and June Chung. I can say all those. Hooray! Anyway, uh, yes, in this one we witness thousands of bug-like beasties smashing their way into Universe 616 from the Negative Zone at the behest of Annihilus, knackering an interstellar prison system called the Kiln, which will become uh, important later on, before taking out the entire Nova Corps, save one lowly Terran, Richard Ryder, whose story I'll be continuing next time. That do? Is that all right? Yeah, you get the idea. Thank you, George. John, do you feel like you've gone deaf? The air conditioning just finished, just shut. Yeah, down. I've noticed it does that. It's really weird. You get so used to the noise, and then it just goes. That's I, normally a sign we've been recording for too long. Mm, I have to ask that. What, why don't you like cosmic comics? Because I, I, I think space opera is and sort of space related comics are generally something that you just don't see enough of. I mainly read comics and books and everything to read about the human condition. And quite often they're not about that. It's much more complicated than that, and probably can't really be, um, probably can't really be justified or rationalised. But certainly not now, because we have to go in a second. Okay. Uh, I just wanted to mention, uh, and it's tangentially connected to comics, which is why I'll mention is it. Is this here, what but, you were going to mention yeah. earlier, but you've forgotten? Okay. But I'll, I'll probably, I'll probably actually mention it. Uh, I'll probably actually talk about it properly on uh, next week's Two Grown Men, which is the parenting podcast I do with James. It's not about parenting, really. It's about two sad old men not really knowing what to do with this bundle of joy and optimism that's entered into their life. That's not strictly about parenting. Uh, It's about being men. Not all men, though. Hashtag not all men. Not all men. but uh, I was very lucky. Well, not lucky. I paid for the ticket. I saw it was happening, so I went to it. And I was very uh, happy to go to a screening of Dave McKean. Uh, oh, Dave McKean's... Damn, I missed that. Uh, ...new film that he's been making for seven years uh, called Luna. I. It's worth mentioning here because he's the chap who... Uh, really defined the look of a lot of Neil Gaiman's comics... Uh, back when Neil Gaiman by himself probably wasn't enough to really make a mark, I reckon, to be honest. It's an interesting one because he did 
is it violent cases yeah. and he signal to noise signal to noise black orchid and black orchid and then it was all the covers for the sandman and also they made mirror mask which yes. i love i think mirror mask is a lovely film uh, except Lu- it's got the creepiest version of the carpenters in it ever luna is very different from mirror mask uh story-wise Dave McKean's sensibilities are very different to Neil Gaiman's. Dave McKean directed both. Yeah. But, but Mirror Mask was written by, by Neil, Neil Gaiman. Gaiman. Um, this film is much more human and much more grounded. It's about uh, two couples reconnecting in a remote place after uh, after one of the couples, a, a year or so after one of the couples lost a, lost a baby. So it's a much more adult film. It's about grown-ups and the stupid relationships we have with each other, adults and the stupid relationships we have with each other. So it's not particularly comic-y, but it does look like a Dave McKean comic. Uh, he uses lots of different styles to um, tell this story, lots of different directing styles, lots of different musical uh, motifs, and... There are lots of animated segments in it that are just incredible. It's really, really good. And he did a Q&A, and he's lovely. Say, yeah, that's why um, I really wanted to go, because I knew he was doing the Q&A, and I missed it. I was too nervous to ask him anything, though. So, anyway, um, that's us. That's us. Uh, thank you, listener. Thank you for listening. You're awesome. Thank you to George and Peter and Kiha. Uh, I'll post links to their stuff where relevant, uh, their stuff on the internet where relevant, uh, in the show notes, remember do check out the show notes. If you like what we do, or you know are ambivalent about it, but would like to leave your mark in our comments, you can comment on any of the posts on um, any of the posts on wehaveissues.net. You can also comment on the Facebook posts. Uh, you can rate and review us on iTunes or your podcatcher of choice. That's a very nice way to show your support or ambivalence. Um, and you can talk to me on Twitter at Nick Site and John on Twitter at John Mom. Uh, that's no H because he's one of those. Thank you, John, for Thank joining you, me Nick. to talk about comics. And, that's all right. Uh, bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>